So this talk was supposed to be about our outer life um, versus our inner life. Um, and this title, I think, in and of itself, it betrays um, a possibly wrong dichotomy that you have in you. Okay? Um, I, there is a proper way to understand the title. Okay? But for most people that are saying this, it means something is wrong. If you have a problem between your inner and outer, it means that something's not right. Um, if you view them as separate worlds, it means that really you have a conflict with yourself. Um, that's why I mean it's, there's something not right. You need to get that resolved. Um, but yes, there is a, there's a secret place. Um, this is the heart, right? The conscience, the mind, that place where whatever it is that thoughts are, wherever it is that thoughts are, um, and where we talk to ourselves and about ourselves and often ignore pr the processes, that's, that's where we're going when we, when we pray. The issue, though, um, is that your outer life is a reflection of your inner life, and the two need to be harmonious for you um, to be at peace with yourself, not in discord. For example, imagine if you're having a romantic relationship with somebody. How many people have a separate inner and outer relationship with someone? Right? Can you imagine being like, oh my, I love her so deeply in my heart, but I'm going to throw eggs at her when I see her? <laughs> right? Like the, the external has nothing to do with your in, internal, right? Unless that was somehow a cultural acceptable way of showing affection. Um, or like, man, I think she's a horribly wicked person and malicious, but I'm going to ask her out for dinner. Right? Like the inverse is also nonsensical. Right? So your, your inner and your outer, if they don't match, there's a problem. Right? Like, so you, you can't be saying one thing and doing something that has nothing to do with what's, what's in there. Um, I use the word nonsensical a lot, and I don't mean it sarcastically. I mean, literally, it's, it's not sensical. Um, so the reality is this absolute need to see everything through the lens of who God is. If you do not do this, I use a lot of absolutisms and hyperbole, so forgive me. I'm, um, you're spiritually messed up, okay? Because um, you're going to hit a wall for sure, somewhere. Why? Okay, ask, let, let's ask, why should everything in my inner and outer match the question of who God is? You, I want you guys to try and tell me that before I, I talk at you. Why, why would that matter? Go for it. So we're saying the inner person is my thoughts, my being, my conscience, like all the stuff that's in me, versus my outer is how I conduct myself and how I'm outwardly perceived or show myself to the world. What, why should everything in my inner and outer life match the question of who is God? I think um, that, you know, it flows from inside out. So it has to start from, from the inside, like, right? and out of the heart, then it spills out to your behavior and your lifestyle. But if there is a difference between what's going inside of you and what's outside of you, most of the time it's um, hypocrisy or just showing off or just acting out. And it's, it's kind right. of difficult to keep that going for a long time. It's, it's Agreed. Difficult. Agreed. But I'm asking, why does that matching up need to match the question of who God is? If you have the image and likeness before you, you're not going to have to debate hard on what to think or say or do in almost any situation, okay? And I'm gonna discuss that near the end. You're not gonna find yourself having a real internal distress about how to make a decision. Um, it won't be that big of a deal to you. Um, before going back to where the topic was going, just because I'm trying to hit every point that was requested to talk about, I was prompted to maybe discuss the debate between praying for something and quote unquote actually doing something, okay? So first, obviously, I want to point out that prayer is actually doing something, okay? So if you treat prayer as though it's that thing of like, what can I do I know, like, other than prayer, right? As though it's this like ridiculous notion, right, that we throw out because we have nothing valuable to offer, right? Then you don't get prayer, okay? But prayer is, is a big deal. Um, if you have met people who actually pray, <laughs> you will see it and know it. Um, you'll understand what it means that there are people whose prayers are what st sustains us. I blogged recently, I was talking about Tan Samira in, in, in LA Diocese. That woman, like, honest to goodness, like, God repose her soul, it's been three years, where, like, I, I felt the meaning of what St. Peter meant when he said, get, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man, 
right? That the, the utter purity of this person in, in her whole being, and especially her prayer, was enough for me to be like, okay, back off. Um, like, I'm uncomfortable, right? Like, you're making me really realize who I am, and it's not, it's not pretty, right? So prayer is a big deal. You meet to someone who prays, and you'll, you'll know why it's a big deal. If to you, prayer is just like the whole, yes, yeah, so pray for me as I pray for you, T-T-Y-L, right? Then... <laughs> Yeah, and it, it might not go so far. But if you have a, a depth in it, right, then it, it can go somewhere, somewhere good. Um, what I think most people mean here is that they are trying to say, um, I don't want to, do I, well, am I going to only pray, right? Is there something I can do in addition, right, to praying? Um, when I take an external action, like my external actions beyond myself. The first part of the answer to this to me is, is do everything prayerfully, Okay, is that that doesn't mean I have prayed about something once, twice, three times, and then I proceed. It's that I'm in a constant state of praying about something and asking God about something. When we get back to the main inner versus outer thing, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Things should be simple. You do what's in your power to do without biasing something. Okay, that's just the general answer for it. If you bias something, um, you, the only ever bias would be towards the absolute. What is absolute? Who God is. Okay, so that's the only time where it's legitimate to have a bias because you don't want to do wrong. For example, a job wants me to work on Sundays. Should I just pray that they change their mind and tell me that I won't need to work on Sundays? Right? Like, that's what I mean about the whole, like, just prayers. Um, well, you, you shouldn't be working on a Sunday if you care about what God says. Okay? I get there might be exceptions, but I'm saying as a standard that needs to be understood that it is wrong not to. And if you're not, even if there's a valid reason, you need to understand that it's, it's, still, it's still wrong, um, even if necessity dictates it at some point. Um, so do you just sit there or do you bring it up? Right? Do you bring it up in an interview and say, actually, Sundays could be an issue for me? Right? As opposed to being like, I'm just hoping that they noticed my cross Right, and that they might say, "Oh, it looks like you love Jesus." Like, <laughs> do you want Sundays off? Right, like they don't do that, um, especially not anymore. Um, or, for example, there's a, a vote locally about whether or not we should le legalize aid to orphans. So, like, not just use negative things. Here's a positive one, right? Of saying we want to make it allowed. Like, I'm, I don't know. I couldn't think of many positive ones because we're a very negative society. Should I just pray that people vote for it and myself do nothing? Right, so intrinsically, internally, I'm like, that's such a beautiful thought, right? I'm going to pray that that happens. Or are you going to go out and, and vote and cast your vote, right? Like, if, if, if that's a civic duty for you to do, right? So you're, if there's an absolute, then you already have an answer. Versus, you don't know if you should take a job in Manhattan or Orange County, okay? Because now there's, there are potentially many different answers to this. There isn't any longer an absolute, Right, And so you might find absolutes if you know that there's a certain thing that you're going to do wrong there, then, then that would help you make the decision. But when there's an absolute, sure, bias that way. When there's no absolute, then no, don't bias it. Now do things prayerfully. And we'll, again, we'll come back to that. But I just wanted to address that so I don't forget because I tend to get sidetracked. So let's return to this question of um, this so-called balance. Um, I'm trying to go through the content faster because I do want room for questions because I'm always accused of being more theoretical than practical. And so I want there to be room at the end for you guys to, to ask stuff. So let's return to this question, like I said, of so-called balance. Um, this is not going to be an issue if your internal life is the foundation for your outer life. Christ is really, really clear on this, right? Where your treasure is there your heart will be also. It is that simple. It's perfectly succinct in that sentence. Whatever you like, that's where your inner life is going to be. Like your treasure, where your heart is, that's your inner life. That's where you're going to be, right? If all you can obsess about right now is your fitness or hooking up, that's where you're going to be. And your external is going to match it. If all you can think about is your promotion, um, then your external is going to match it. If all you can think about is that you want to get yourself ordained or be a mean khidma or a steward or whatever, that's what you're going to do. It's going to be whatever is going on on the inside of you is going to come out on the outside. That's true for all of us, right? That's why it's so hard for people to hide, right? Like people know, right? People know even in the service when somebody's being ambitious, right? Like everybody is able to spot them out relatively quickly of being like, yeah, he used to be really nice and now he's really like opportunistic, 
right? Or like she used to be really peaceful, and now she's clobbering everyone in her way, right? Like there's, and sometimes it's more subtle, but people get exposed because you're not gonna be able to hide it because you're constantly doing this thing that you want because of how badly um, you want it. So if your goal is salvation, if your goal is the recovery of this image and likeness in which you were created, then your inner disposition is one of unity with God. And you're not going to have a separate world. You have one world, and you will not be in a dichotomy of choice. You won't. Think to any conflict that you have, any conflict right now. Think of any in your mind. And I guarantee you, it is a conflict of your will and someone else's will. Period. Because when we want the same thing, no one's angry, right? No one's going to be like, I'm so mad that you want to go to the same restaurant, right? Like, it's like, okay, this is so much easier. We want to go to the same place, right? You only get upset because you have a conflict of will. And so then the question is, is there a right will to which I should align my own? And the answer is absolutely, certainly, with all certainty, yes. And so if that's the case, then you don't need to have a dichotomy. You might struggle with the... Um, the doing of that, that's totally understandable, but you're not going to have a struggle about what is the right or the wrong. And as you train yourself to always do the right, things get a lot easier. The question is whether or not your will is aligned with what is right, or not. This is not a problem of inner and outer life. Like I want to I want to suggest that to you. You don't have a problem of inner and outer life. Right? The real issue is a problem of internal life only. And you're seeing the manifestation of what's wrong in your internal life by the way that they're manifested, which will be your thoughts, your actions, your emotions, your external actions and your thoughts. It's going to be a reflection of what's not fixed or balanced or understood yet from on the inside. So the real question then is one actually of spiritual identity. I want you to listen to hear what St. Paul says. St. Paul is, I really didn't like him at all in high school. I thought he was way too complicated and complex. Um, now I'm like, he's like one of the most brilliant Christian minds to walk the earth. Um, like he, he got it, which understandably, I guess when you see Jesus for three years, it helps. But, um, so then brethren, we are debtors. Okay. So we're in debt. Okay. We have, we have this, we have dues, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. It's like, okay. Like you're, you're, you don't owe anything to, 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 to living. Okay. From a biological standpoint, you're going to die. Okay, so whatever it is you think you're going to owe, you're going to end up dying, right? So he's saying, so let's look at that aside. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So if you, if you have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit within you, okay, you have received the sonship or daughtership to God. Um, and that changes things, right? And what does it change? For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, Right, saying you didn't, you didn't get the spirit from God to be like on your knees trembling as though you have handcuffs around your, your, and shackles on you to sit in front of God being like, oh, I tremble before you and, and all this like really um, elaborate language. Um, instead, he's saying you've received a spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father. Do you know what Abba meant in, like, in, in those times, like from a colloquial sense, what the coven was? Dead. Yeah, dad or daddy, right? Baba, right? Yeah. So, yeah, Abba. Like, so it's, it's, it's not even like, like, I mean, it's good to have reverent language for God, and we call him the Almighty, the Pantocrator, the this and that, right? But it's also so endearing that God said, call me dad, because I am, right? It's not, it's not, it's not a joke. <laughs> I am your dad, right? So I'm your Baba. Right? So he's saying, so I'm giving you the spirit where you can call me this. I'm actually freeing you, not tying you. If this, it is the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is a fact. And if children, then heirs. 
heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So number one, where did you receive this sonship and daughtership? It's not actually even in the receiving of the spirit and baptism. It's by being born, period. Because you're in the image and likeness of God. The gift of the image and likeness of God was granted to absolutely every single human being. It's something that only humans got, right? So we have something restored and fixed when we receive the Holy Spirit. We need to receive the Holy Spirit, right? Is that, that we have a fallen nature. But we're, we already have this identity, right? We have our parents' DNA biologically. We have God's DNA. There is such thing as objective health spiritually. There is such thing as objective right and wrong and perfection. It is in the person of God, which is very anti our culture, right? Of this is your truth, right? Um, you do you, and, and, and like, that's cool as long as you don't hurt me. Um, I'm so down with that, except that like, I think you're a bigot, right? Like all that kind of stuff. So we, we actually do have a stance. We actually really do believe there's a right and wrong, and that actually should matter to you, right? And that shouldn't be something foreign to you, because if it's foreign to you, your inner and outer life are going to be in conflict, right? It's, it's, it's that simple. So one is you're, you receive this sonship, you receive this daughtership to God, okay? So now you need to ask about what your identity is, what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. Right, is that A, you have this DNA, that means something. It means there's a reason, I don't know if you guys think about it, there's a reason why people feel calm when they pray, right? When they actually pray, not when they're just like, no, 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 right? But when they actually pray, why people feel calm, regardless of religion. Because every single being has a spirit, right? So the, imagine somebody who eats healthy by accident, right? They're going to still get benefits of health, right? It's not that since you didn't know what health was, you got no benefit. No, they got benefit. Right? And they might even be able to experimentally find out that eating unhealthy makes them feel gross. Right? And that would be a valid experience too. It's just it's an ignorant one. Ignorant in, in the real sense of the word, in the sense of lacking knowledge. Right? It's an uninformed one, an undifferentiated one. And so there's a reason why, there are th there's a reason why we happen to mostly agree it's not good to kill people. Right? There's a reason why we tend to mostly agree that you shouldn't steal and take things from people. I mean, things are changing, but whatever. Um, it's because we have this common image and likeness of God within us. But then now ask a, a deeper question. What does it mean to be a son or a daughter? When you proclaim yourself to be the son or a daughter of who your parents are right now, what does that mean? Right, I'm not going to answer that, but I want you to think about that. What does it mean? What does it mean about your family? What does it mean about how you project yourself? What does it mean? What are the duties of a son or a daughter towards the parents? What are the duties of the parents towards the kids? What are the duties of the siblings towards one another? Are there duties? Because if you don't recognize your role, then you're also living a role that you don't even get. Again, there's going to be an internal issue of being like, like most of us are living our lives being that raw and spoiled teenager that thinks that because when, when we came out of the womb, someone was like feeding us, changing our diapers, and doing all that, that that should be what we're entitled to for the rest of our lives, right? And, and understandably, because we've been pampered like crazy. So the first time we get a no, we are, we're up in arms, right, of like, how dare they say no? If they loved me, right, would they say no, right? These are normal phases, and we do these things in the spiritual life all the time. But we often do with God of being like, if he was a loving God, he would not have let me do so poorly on my exam, right? Like, because that was the end of the world, right? But that we somehow throw this tantrum back up, or this expectation of, if I behave and do my chores, Jesus gives me prizes, Right? And he's going to give me allowance. And allowance means I get into med school. Right? Or it lets me get into this competitive thing. It means that I'm going to get into a job that nobody else is going to get into. It's really messed up. Right? Like, have you ever thought about when we sometimes are praying for things like, um, please, Lord, let me get that job. And there's like 15 people applying. And we somehow feel entitled as Christians that we should be that one who got the job. Where I'm like, what if someone was way more qualified than, than me that applied? Like, why, why should they be penalized for not being a devout, righteous, um, like, which is, some, which is what we're saying on some level, right, person, um, and I don't like it. Or what if there's some other guy who his family and his in-laws and, like, five families are dependent on that person's income. If he doesn't get the job, they're not going to eat, right? And yet we can still turn around and go home and just be like, that God, I'm not going to pray next time, right? Or, or... It didn't work this time. I must not have offered enough alms, right? I didn't do enough chores. Next time I'm going to do double my chores, and I'm going to replace my intercessor, 
right? Like we, we need to, to get real. So understand your role, okay, as a son or a daughter and what that means and what are your responsibilities and what are you asking? How are you reacting, right, to your parents? Are you throwing a fit? Are you throwing a tantrum? Are you trying to understand, right? What are you doing? R relate whatever your real life experience is to that with God. Third is what St. Paul says is the third step. Because you're not just the son of anybody. You're the son of the king. And that might sound really like cliche today, but it's, 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 it's a fact, right? You're royalty. That changes everything, right? Because now it says something about this king because he adopted us, right? He adopted us, right? We're not his sons and daughters by nature. Only, only our Lord is, right? But we were adopted, right? That's what St. Paul's saying. And he's saying, I'm sharing my kingdom with you. And I don't need to. I can handle it very well on my own. <laughs> I can handle it way better than you. But I want you to participate with me. I'm making you guys heirs. So your Prince William, or Princess Di, or Princess whatever her name is, the new one um, from Suits, um, <laughs> there's an expectation of the royalty right, that they somehow demonstrate the principles of the kingdom, right? Like, is that not a, a valid expectation, right? Like, if, 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 so, if Queen Elizabeth, like, I'm Canadian, so we're loyal to the queen, right? So if she came to, to Canada and, like, I don't know, started trash-talking the prime minister, like, on TV, I think we'd all be like, that's kind of weird. Like, why is she doing that? Even if I agree with her opinion, right, it would be like, why, why is she doing that? Right? Like it would, there would be a response of, like, is that how dignitaries act? I thought diplomats don't do that. Right? I thought people of position don't do that. I mean, again, much has changed in the last period. Um, but <laughs> there, is, <laughs> there used to be decorum um, and diplomacy. Um, you need to care about it the way that anyone would care about their kingdom. You should have that sense within you. They'll, uh, someone who has that, they're going to be protective of it. Um, not squalling it, not like treating it cheaply. Um, they'll want to know their history, their roots, where it came from. Um, they'll want to dress appropriately. I don't just mean in terms of your physical attire. I mean, I was saying that a dignitary has a uniform, for example, or maybe, I don't even know actually. Um, but you would expect a certain decorum, right, of, of, of minimum level. So that people will s who see you know from your regalia to what you belong. And then they will ask you about stuff or they're going to react to you in some way, right? That's, that's going to be the natural response, right? Oh, you're from there, right? That could have a positive, negative, who knows? But there's going to be some kind of response. I know a monk, actually, um, for whom, like, this is his life. This is, like, literally all he talks about. Every year when I visit him, he's, he's been a hermit for something like 50 years. Um, and it's all he talks about. And it was so moving to me because it wasn't what I was expecting. I would watch him, not just in my own conversation with him, but other people that would come to him, right? And his answer is like, you are the son of God. Um, like everything. And the person's like, I can't get my homework done. <laughs> it's like, you are the son of God. And I'm like, I'm not making the link. Um, because for him, <laughs> right, this identity has been internalized so truly that he can go to all of the virtue right away. And he goes to all of the self-value and the worth and, and what dignity you have. Not lowering you, dignifying you, right? Of saying, look at how lucky you are. How can you even be upset about this? Don't you know you're a king, right? Who gets angry about homework when they're king, right? Like, that's another way, like, of, of seeing it, right? You still need to do your homework. But um, there's, there's this deepness of how much has entered. Like, I want to make the point of how deeply it entered that his life revolves around this concept, and I have never seen someone more joyous. This is a monk that I have never actually genuinely not seen smiling year to year. I haven't, right? Like, he's just constantly smiling. That, like, the name, when his name gets mentioned, I'm just, I smile, because I'm like, oh yeah, right? Like, it just, it feels pleasant because of how much it's in there. Now I'm going to ask you questions, and I, I want to emphasize, I'm not shaming you. I'm not going to ask anyone to answer these out loud, but I want you to answer them internally. Sorry, David. Um, internally, because I want to make a point out of this, okay? Um, 
pretending you hadn't heard what we said earlier, do you know what is your identity? How many of you have read books that pertain to doctrine? How many of you have read many books about or by the early church fathers? How many of you know the approach of the early church fathers towards Greek philosophers like Plato or Socrates? How many of you have read any full lives of the saints? And I'm not talking about the Cynixarium. Okay, like Life of Antony, Life of Macarius, Life of Bishoy. Um, there's, there's a bunch of full biographies we're talking about, like 100, 200 page books, um, and some shorter. How many of you have read the whole Cynixarium on your own outside of church? How many of you have read do-it-yourself books? How many of you have read self-help books? How many of you have read books pertaining to your profession? How many of you think that most people could become great physicians without reading, studying, and practicing? How many of you have read Harry Potter? How many of you have read Harry Potter multiple times? How many of you have read the whole Bible? How many of you have read the whole Bible multiple times? Who knows what the big deal was with Ezra and Nehemiah? Who knows why Christ could actually articulate why Christ was crucified beyond to forgive me my sins? How many of you have memorized Jesus loves me? How many of you know really and truly what the Holy Spirit actually does in your life and what he can do in your life, actually knows what that is, beyond words. How many of you have the same longing to pray that you have to catch up with your favorite Netflix series? How many of you believe actually in spiritual gifts at all, whether it's clairvoyance or so or exorcisms? How many of you actually believe in that truly? How many of you, when you see a positive quality in other people, attribute it to being a fruit of the Spirit worthy of praise or an attribute of God worthy of love versus seeing it only as that person's humanity? How many of you are aware of what vices you have? How many of you are actively and truly know how to work on those vices? So again, I'm not intending to shame at all. I'm as guilty as, as everyone on, on most of these. Um, but this is some kind of indication of what your interior life looks like. That's why I'm asking them, right? The answers of these say a lot about what your interior life looks like. You don't magically know stuff, right? You don't magically have depth. You don't magically um, just like some kind of osmosis, right, of being in the right place suddenly just come transformed and know right from wrong, right? And you don't do that with other aspects of your life. Right? Nobody gets through, through college like not writing exams and having have done something to retain knowledge. There's something that got done. Right? How many of us have any work that we put in towards our interior life? And if it's not being built, please don't be shocked when your interior and exterior life are in conflict. So let's return again to the question of this balance between career, service, and church, life, relationships. If you don't know the stuff we were talking about in those questions above, you're going to struggle with this um, in your life, and I mean right now. Um, but if you have the principles, you're not going to be afraid, actually, of how to approach these, even with trial and error, even if there's mistakes. You're, you're going to be calm um, about everything. So I'm going to give some examples. I've chosen like three different examples because everyone accuses me of not being real and, and all that stuff. Um, so... I want to make a point that I don't disclose people's confessions um, and that any examples that I've used are typically things that have actually come up so much because sometimes somebody will hear it and think that I'm talking about them and I'm like, dude, there's like 40 people who talk about the same thing. Um, so I'm, I'm not meaning any particular individual just because now that everything is streamed everywhere, there's going to be someone somewhere who's like, wait, that was me. Um, so this is a very common example, all caps, okay? A guy is in love with service, okay, and might even have a warfare or a calling, we don't know yet, toward priesthood. He gets married. 
the lady friend, or I guess it's his wife now, um, is originally <laughs> totally cool and chill with his service, but then they have a kid. The guy wants to keep serving like mad, but she's struggling. So what happens? They start fighting. The guy will be all up in arms about how this is the love of God and how can one say no to Jesus, haram al ayel, and what would they do without me and I just love them so much and all that nice, beautiful, like spiritual talk. And then the wife is like, yeah, well, I actually, um, I don't know if I just hate Jesus right now, like, or if you're making me not like him, um, but I'm not okay with what you're doing. Um, like right now, like I want Jesus in my home. Um, so you need to be at home with me and with the kids. Um, and so then where is the balance is always the question. So to me, again, this isn't a balance issue, okay? This is a principle issue. That's what I'm trying to get over and over is your interior. What have you built as the rights and wrongs according to the image and likeness? So to get to the answer of this question, okay, requires understanding a bunch of things. One, what's the goal of service? What is the objective? If you don't know what it is, then there's a problem if you're saying that I need to do it. What is the goal of marriage? What is the goal of upbringing kids? What's the understanding of the roles of each person in a marriage? What's the duty of a husband toward his wife? What's the duty of his toward the church and the community at large? How much should he be supporting his wife and sacrificing for his wife? Here's a principle of sacrifice. How much should she be doing as well? What is the aim of this person's service? Was this person serving to keep being seen by the clergy and others as a righteous, sacrificial man worthy of priesthood? Okay, is he campaigning? Or is it that service is so in his DNA that he just can't say no, right? Like it's not always negative, right? It could be, right? And it could be a genuine, deep, full zeal um, and love, right, that this person has. Um, is it motivated by, um, is, it, is, it, is this a self-loving thing? Is, is he being covetous, okay, of the priesthood? Um, or is it for egotistical reasons? Um, is it motivated by anything that is wrong, okay? Because we have these objective rights and wrong. We have the image and likeness of God. If it is not motivated by wrong, to what extent ought he still to deny his will for the needs of his home, right? These are, again, we come back to the principles, right? Just because one of them is met doesn't mean there's not an issue still at hand to be um, discussed. For the wife, is she guarding her husband from going out because she's petrified of him actually becoming a priest, right? Is that actually the real reason? Um, is she being selfish with her time and really is just bored and wants him with her 24-7, right? Is that what's going on? It's possible that she's also doing something that's not principally 100% accurate. Is she genuinely struggling and feeling like she's being neglected, or does she just have a control issue in general, right? Is there an internal issue that's going on? If the husband has a genuine love language of service, is the wife also in a form understandable to the husband, trying to make sure that he has an ability to express this in some way? Right, of saying, okay, I get that this is how you live and breathe and, 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 and show your love for God. I get it. Then, like, but we need to compromise because I have these needs. Are the two serving one another? Right? Is that happening or not? I could go on. I mean, there's so many things that could be here. But my point is to say, it's not about balance. Right? If you go and set a time limit and say, all right, here's a schedule. From now on, you get to do one youth meeting per week. Okay, you get one Vespers and you get two liturgies max. Right? You, you happy, ma'am and them? Right? And then on his end, it'll be like, okay, but she has to make sure that she doesn't ask me questions about it when I come. Like, it's ridiculous because you're not dealing with the real issue. It's, not the, it's the principle. Right? Go back to the principle. What is out of whack? Right? What is it that's not resolved? Where is there an ego issue? Where is there a sin issue? Where is there a pride issue? Where is there just a not understanding one another issue? Right? There's so many different things. It wasn't a balance issue. It was more of a communication, understanding, and principle. Right? That's, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not an obvious um, answer. But I want to challenge you back to show how this fits in your life in general. Let's step back further, okay, before they're even married. What did this couple do when they were dating or, or courting? I don't know if we're allowed to date. Um, was the person... <laughs> no dates. Okay. Was the person active in service during that time? 
Or did they drop all of their service for the sake of wooing this woman, okay, or man? Because sometimes actually it's the woman who's serving way more. And if so, well, then you presented a wrong image, right? Like you, you showed somebody that you're not, right? And so now your spouse is like, who are you? Right? I don't know that guy or that girl. That wasn't who you presented to me. You weren't as believing in a principle as you might think you did because you sacrificed. You sacrificed service. That means that it couldn't have been as big of a deal as you're currently claiming if for like a year or two you were totally fine with totally getting rid of it. Right? That wouldn't make so much sense. Um, it, it might have dropped a little. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but if you love the service that sincerely, it wouldn't, have been it wouldn't have been dropped to a zero. So you valued something else more at the time. And so when you go back to a different valuing system, you are giving an impression that you are now valuing your spouse less, right? You created the problem, right? Because there's a period where you said to your spouse, you mattered more to me than the service. But then once you got married, it was like, actually not anymore. Right? Then it's just like, oh wait, so what, what am I now? So of course there's going to be um, a struggle. Did you try out when you were courting or dating or whatever, did you try and find out if you were actually compatible or are you trying to make yourselves compatible? Right? Um, because that's going to affect your inner outer thing for sure. Um, what did you discuss about the goals of your marriage? If you did all of this, it wouldn't be a question of balance, it would be a question of participation in one another's realities, not projections of realities. For those who love to serve, for example, did you serve together during this time at all, or even discuss how to go about doing that? That would show that you both valued it, or, or it wouldn't come up in conversation. If you don't care about service, you're not going to talk about it, right? If you care about service, you're going to talk about it. Did you make it clear that you're an aesthetically you're an ascetical person who doesn't like to go out at all, but loves to pray for a long time in your room, right? Like that sometimes happens to people where somebody's like, oh, I love going to meetings. Everyone's like, no, just lock me up in my prayer room. I'll pray for hours. I don't want to go to a meeting, right? But what did you project um, during that time? Did you present that service to you has always been ex exemplified in the service within the family, immediate and extended or no? What did you present? Because the issue wasn't about balance. It was about principles. A person needs money to live, right? We can all agree on that. We overuse that line. Um, we live in a consumerist world. Um, to climb the ladder at work, okay, I'm making up this example, requires you to put in 80 hours a week. So how are you supposed to find time for your family, your friends, for God, and your service? Again, to me, this is a principal issue, right? It's not an internal out outer one. Is financial gain your number one value? That's the question you have to ask. Because if that is what you value, you will choose it. It is so simple. We are not as complex as we like to, to, to make it seem sometimes, right? It's I want, I take, right? And then sometimes I fight myself. If something definitely temporal, uh, temporary, okay, or an exception, the, is this situation, this 80 hours a week thing, is it temporary? Or is it an exception, or do you just wish that it was temporary, okay? For example, is there a time cap on how long you have to work like an animal for, okay? If, it, is it, if it's short, maybe it's doable, right? Maybe if there's a, like a specific period where it's like, no, we're sorry, this project period is just this time, okay, that's different, right? Of saying, we know the start, we know the end, let me figure out what's needed or what's necessary. If it's long, okay, like it's years or something, is this the right time in your life to do something like that? Is it the beginning of your marriage, for example? If so, you're taking away from the building up of your early family life, which is an extremely important time. Really, really important time. Those first two years of marriage, I thankfully haven't done it, are really brutal, I hear. Um, and so there's a lot of forming, storming, norming, performing, and all those things that go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can get away with some things that other married priests can't. Um, but it's essential, it's necessary, it's very necessary. And actually, to be fair, in the monastic community, it's true too, right? The beginning, actually, of a monastic life is actually usually full of um, confrontation, 
A lot of people don't realize that. It's not like this, this beautiful image of the books of like you lay down, you're really like, oh yes, Abba, please tell me I'm wrong, right? It's just like, he keeps telling me I'm wrong. I'm not wrong. Um, but on the outside, <laughs> right? So we, we go through it in our own way, but it was necessary because we form community. We learn each other's personalities. We learn, we forget, for example, that people, when they grow up in a family, which are people you probably wouldn't have lived with by choice, right? Is that you've been forced to figure each other out what your, what your bombs are, what are nuclear issues, like don't bring this issue up with that, That's, they, don't do that, right? This one is I'm gonna talk to mom about, right? These are, I know how they react to this, right? Because you've, you've built that. You don't have that at the beginning of a marriage, no matter how long you've dated, right? And so you're, you're reforming boundaries. You're still trying to figure out, oh my goodness, this wasn't the reaction I thought. Right? And it causes issues. So is this the time when you think is a great time to devote 80 hours a week to your job and say, this is for us? Is it? Like, really, is it? Right? Objectively, is it? Or is it financially for us? Right? Figure out your, your, your principle. Um, not being present at this time means delay of some really big problems that might shake you and make you doubt when you have them later. Right? So imagine you ignored this period of fighting because you escaped it by working 80 hours a week. And then five, seven years later when you finally stop and you start having the fights you would have had that many years ago that you're not having because you don't talk to each other or see each other, suddenly you're just like, I think I made the wrong choice. Your world comes crashing. Right? You've actually created a monumental problem for yourself and not realize that this is actually normal because it wasn't normal for you. Right? These are, are important things to think about. Or is it when the kids are in high school? Is it when they're in college, right? Where in your life are you thinking to do this? These questions matter for principle if you have an important principle or value of spending quality time in developing your marriage and your family. Likewise, if you care so much about service as a principle, then are you making a decision that goes against that value? Is it money that matters to you the most? What if you can live comfortably, but not richly, right? Do you need to be? rich. And for those of you, I mean, many people say that, I'm like, I just want to be comfortable, you know, like, um, and then they get whatever their goal was, but it's never enough, right? I was reading um, Social Justice by St. Basil the Great. It's phenomenal. Um, and it, it was mind-boggling to me that he was talking about the exact, exact, exact same issues today. Um, you know what it is. You've read it. It's phenomenal, right? And I'm like, it was, it was old language, same problems, where they were like, instead of upgrading the cars, upgrading the chariot, right? And it was, I want to have enough saved for my kids, right? And, and he's not necessarily saying those things are, are wrong, but the question is like, where are your lines? And do you actually define it, right? Or do you just throw out these really cliche lines that are meant to sound deep, discerning, moderate, right? And that you actually don't live in any way close to, right? Like ask yourself whether you're doing that or not. Um, this is why I'm saying, I hope that what I'm trying to show is, this is not a balance issue, okay? This is about what you value. It's about what, you, what your principle is. And if you have image and likeness in front of you, these things become way more obvious. So this is summarized. I'm going to end with this and open it up to questions. If there's time, I think I talked too much. I'm sorry. Um, I want to read something that our Lord said that summarizes all of this very, very clearly. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them, you who are his adopted sons and daughters and heirs? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one inch to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor, nor spin, like they're not sowing, they're not trying to, to pay for a living. Yet I tell you that even, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. Therefore not be, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. When he says seek the kingdom first, he's saying care about right and wrong first. Everything else is going to be taken care of. You're going to have enough money. You're going to have enough food. You're going to have clothes on your back. You're going to live. Just want to fix your internal first, which is the image and likeness of God. To him be glory now and forever to the age of ages. Amen. <laughs>